school season starts February 27th, first week to 15th, the season ends May 18th. Everybody okay with that? Okay, we'll move right along. We've really worked hard on the website. That gentleman that just walked in and out of here, Bill Gillespie, has really worked hard to improve the website. We're not trying to be the media hub, but we're trying to make it very efficient for coaches, athletic directors, principals, and officials. We're trying to improve it, and we've really done that, okay? If you are an official, all you have to do is go to the website right there, click on officials across the top, go down to officials packets, there's track officials, it's that easy to get to your packet. Now this is not the screenshot for a coach, but if you are a coach, just go to the website, click on sports, click on track, and in the bottom right hand corner will be the coach's packet. Okay, very easy to find, everything is a toolbar across the top, everything's drop down menus now. If you've got suggestions for the website, send them to us. We're always trying to improve it, okay? Officials, remember to have your pre meeting meeting with your coach and your captain. That's very important, okay? West Virginia State Law 61-2-15A deals with situations where if you're performing the duties of the coach or the official and something bad happens, basically if somebody lays their hands on you, okay, physically, we need you to press charges. You have to press them, okay? But you have to do it in the, in the county where it occurred with that magistrate. So go to the magistrate's office in the county that occurred and press those charges. You can't let things like that go uh, without consequence. Okay? Schools will be very cooperative in those investigations, I assure you of that. If you need a school name of any coach in any sport, or you need the director, the AD, the principal, or anything, of course that's available on our website. The track's different than most sports. So if you're an official, you have a special report, please email it to me. Right here is my email. It's just wayne.ryan at wbssac.org. Try to do that as quick as you can. I'll try to respond as quick as I can. All right, if you're a coach, if you have the same thing, something special, something we need to know about, just email that report to us. The reason it's like this in track is we're going to value the officials like we do in other sports, okay? I want to clear up objections real quick. We've had a little confusion in the past in track. We had a little confusion uh, in golf this fall because they're sports that have DQs and ejections. All right, now obviously if you fall start, you get disqualified. You get DQ'd from that event only, all right? But if because you get DQ'd, you decide to go crazy and throw the baton and give a big cussing fit to someone and show yourself, then you may get ejected from the meeting. You understand the difference? If someone, an athlete gets ejected, they must set out the next two track meets, okay? Not DQ, that's gonna happen. That's just that event, okay? But if the behavior requires ejection, and we want to make sure they set out the next two events. That's why you would send me by email that special report. Okay? Officials, your part one exam is online only. Test with us February 6th to March 6th. Hey, if you wait till March 4th or 5th, somebody in this room is going to have a great story for me. And it'll be true. I mean, I've had some great ones. And they're not from kids who didn't turn in their homework. They're from adults who didn't get their test taken on time. All right? But if you don't take the test on time, there's 14 days and you've got to pay $50. So my advice is go ahead and jump on that and get it done on time. Okay? The instructions are in your mind. Even though I'd like to be told that they need to read something, but if you read the interscholastic, <coughs> you will really pick up a lot of information. It will answer a lot of questions that you have. Whether you're a coach or official, please read the interscholastic. Please be very familiar with the rules and regulations handbook. And of course, we have a lot of information on the website that will be beneficial to you. Okay? All right, I'm moving good. Sportsmanship's important. No matter which hat you're wearing, and some of us wear different hats at different times. I didn't give you my background, but I was the coach for 30 years. I was the athletic director for 22 years. I was assistant principal for 11 years. I was a daddy the whole time, okay? And I umpired baseball for 14 years. So I've got perspective from all the different angles, and I know how they all feel different. Truly do, okay? We want to keep that perspective. But we want to make sure that we are professional, okay? And if something's going on that's not appropriate, and we ignore it, we're telling you it's okay. My quick example is football coaches on the sideline this fall. I go to a game, they're on the sideline with tobacco in their mouth, and they've got a big dip in on the sideline. All right, well, if I ignore that, I'm promoting it, telling them it's okay after there's a point of emphasis in the fall of football coaches. So I've got to go to these three guys. Now I don't do it while they're in the headsets, call plays. I wait till halftime and walk in the dressing room and you know, tell them what I have to say. It's inappropriate, okay? I didn't ignore it, or I would have been promoted. Try it. If they're up there under the tent, make it out. It's not appropriate. Don't 
or ignore it. Okay. You're a role model. You're either good or bad. Help us out. Be good. All right? Choose to be a good one. And we believe in education based athletics. Got to go to school, got to make certain grades, got to represent your community, represent your school, represent your peers. I think that's great. All right? The memories and the lessons and the things and experiences you have in education based athletics are huge. Played all kinds of athletics. Some out of school, some school related, memories from the ones that were school related. It's just, it's, you know, I don't know that there's anything more special in high school athletics. Raise is no more a corporate sponsor, we appreciate, pay no tobacco at any SSAC event or on any school property in West Virginia. Coach, I'll get to, I'll get to out of season later. Coach, conversation. If you're a teacher, ignore this. If you're not a teacher, you must be uh, you must be an authorized, certified coach. You only do that through your state through your state department and your county board of education. You must be hired or approved by your county board of education. Do not use the term volunteer. There is no such thing. You must be hired or approved by your board of education. It just may be a no pay. Okay, but you've got to be hired or approved by the board of education to get out there and instruct kids. All right. So make sure. You filled out Form 39, it's been sent to the State Department of Education, you paid your $35, you have a state employee number, and the county board has you approved or out. And guys, if you're having your head coach, don't have the assistants out there that haven't had that done. Okay, you have no answer for that if something happens. You have to have your eligibility in before your first contest. If you don't, there's a $25 fine. We're not after your money. You all set to forfeit. We don't want that either. We want everybody on the eligibility for catastrophic insurance. If they're on an eligibility and something terrible happens, there's catastrophic insurance to cover them. For instance, last year in Eastern Panhandle, we had a baseball player who lost the vision in his right eye. Okay? Catastrophic insurance kicks in. He's not on that eligibility, it's a mess. How do you make sure your kids are on the eligibility? It's really, really simple. You provide your athletic director, your principal, the list, the roster. They put them on the eligibility online. Have them print you a copy, a hard copy, and check it off. Make sure everybody's there. Now, yes, you can check it online, too, but trust me, that's harder than printing a hard copy and making sure everybody's on that eligibility. It's not worth the risk, so make sure everybody's there. If you ever end up in court, you have to show good faith as a coach that you did these ten things. And I'm not going to cover all ten of them, but I'll, I'll touch on a couple. And this happens a lot. Guys, they're, uh, they're, when we go to national conference, every year we get tons and tons of cases and stories about lawsuits that are in courts, active. All right. For instance, we've got coaches being sued because an athlete got injured. And the parents are sued because they say the coach didn't properly condition their son or daughter for that sport. I mean, it's crazy. You have to be careful. Along those lines, look at number one, properly plan your activity. A teacher has a lesson plan, a coach should have a practice plan. You should have a practice schedule, you should document what you do, you should have it on your computer or have it in your hard file, and you should have a record of what you've done in practice. But the drills you've done, the activities you've done, you should include your water breaks on that too. I'll get to that in a little bit. So you need a practice schedule and you need documentation to cover yourself right there. All right? You've got to make sure you provide a safe and physical environment, adequate proper equipment. Hey, we're, we're throwing stuff and we're jumping over stuff. Okay? Let's make sure that we make the environment as safe as we can. Now, Look at number 10, protect against physical and psychological harm from others. And look at number 8, start to supervise the activity closely. Coaches, sometimes you get guilty of having coaches' meetings during practice or coaches' meetings after practice. Okay, practice is over, it's been a good day, send them in so the coaches get together and talk. Who's going to run a shuttle holes? What are we going to put Michael in? Are we going to put him in this individual event? Put him on a what are we going to do with these guys to maximize them? How are we going to use them? And you've got teenagers in the rooms getting dressed unsupervised. Bad idea. You tell me the good idea of that. You tell me what your answer is if something happens in a dressing room and you're not supervising. You have no answer. Don't put yourself in that situation. Fill in some liability issues, kind of what we talked on. Non-school participation. If you have that great track athlete who gets invited to some regional track event and they're going to that event, okay, then understand there's some stipulations or they lose their eligibility in high school. They cannot run in a school uniform. The school cannot sponsor them, help provide the transportation, pay an entry fee, or anything like that. You cannot coach them. All right, now here's the kicker. They can't miss your activity to go do that. They can go to that individual track event, that showcase. Okay, that's fine. 
Don't practice that day. Because technically, if they go to that event and miss your practice, they are ineligible. So give everybody the day off if you send kids from your track team to special events like that. Everybody good? Okay. You have to have 14 days of practice before your first track meet. I think you know that. You have to have seven if they're in seasons that overlap. Like if they're playing basketball right now and they go to tournament play pass when you all start on the 27th, then they only have to have seven practices. It doesn't say seven consecutive. It says seven practices. However, they have to be in practice the first day that they're in school after their other season ends. Example. I'm in a state basketball tournament, and I lose on Thursday. I mean, we stay in Charleston. We didn't come back to school on Friday. So when's my first day of track practice? Monday, my first day that I attend school. All right? So the first day that they attend school after that other season ends is the, needs to be their first day of track practice. Sometimes that even requires modifications. I'll give you an example. My son played football. He carried the ball 35 times a night. They lost their state playoff game on, on a Saturday night. Well, I'm going to tell you something. On Monday, he was in no shape or did not feel like being in basketball practice, okay? He has to be there. Coach modifies his and a few other guys' schedules for that day, but they're in practice that day. Everybody okay? All right. Um, what's next? Track is really letting us down on sanction. This has to change and improve, and I'm thankful that at every clinic I've been to so far, two days later, from that area, in comes sanction forms. So somebody's listening to me, so that's a good thing. If you give any award, you've got to sanction the event. Any award, ribbons, medals, plaques, anything. If an award is given, sanction the event. Okay. Now, if it's intrastate, that means within West Virginia, if there's more than four schools, it's got to be sanctioned. Volleyball is my best example. A quad is four teams, does not need sanction. Add a fifth team, got to be sanctioned. More than four makes five. If there's five schools in your track meet, you've got to sanction them. They're all West Virginia schools. Okay? Why do you sanction? For three reasons. One, I have to make sure the date's valid. You're not going on Sunday, you're not going on Sunday outside the season, you're good on dates. Two, I gotta make sure you give it the right kind of awards. No clothing can be given as an award. It has to be ribbons, medals, plaques, trophies. Okay, so that keeps you from breaking rules by me getting the double check. Third thing is, I gotta make sure you're competing against legal schools. You can compete against SSAC schools, you can compete against any school that's exemption K through 8 by the State Department of Education. You can't play Huntington Prep. Huntington Prep is not a school, okay? They don't have a report card that says Huntington Prep. It's an AAU team that tries to spin off as a school. Big difference, okay? So they've got to be a real educational-based school for you to compete against them, okay? Those are the things I have to check. That's the three big areas. Now, if it's interstate and you're going, and going out of town, it's any event in which there's four or more. All right, so that's different. It's not more than four, it's four or more, but it's confusing, all right? And any participation from bordering states, you've got to get sanctioned. Now, how do you sanction? The bottom way is the paper form. Go to the website, go to forms, print the SSAC sanction form, fill it out, fax it in. You can still do that for now. Next fall, that option will not be available. We're putting everybody onto the website. We've really worked on this R. Our, our IT guy has improved, but he doesn't speak athletics. He really, trust me, doesn't. But we're finally getting him on board to understand what we want. Okay? And you just go to the website, you go to admin log on, you go to the forms management, and then under WBS, it's all drop down menus. Under WBS SAC forms, go to new forms, sanction form, then it's fill in boxes. It's really painless. Okay? Uh, you gotta give me awards, you gotta give me dates, you gotta give me who to contact if there's a problem with the form and I need to know more information. The hardest thing is you've got to fill in the schools that are in the event. If you don't know, you put everybody that you can. All right? If that needs modified later, you cannot go back and edit, you just send me the email. Final list of schools. Okay? That happens quite a bit. Especially, you know, you invite 20 schools and you're hoping to get 10. We understand. Okay? Questions on sanction? Please sanction your events. If you give a award sanction. More than five words for the sanction. Okay? All right. Guys, when you come to the state tournament, a couple things. One, you've got to provide us a rooting list. So have that filled out ahead of time. It'll be in your packet. Give it to us at the table when you bring the team. Register, okay? Two, stay at one of these approved hotels, please. Here's why. If you do, we're going to give you some reimbursement. It's not going to make you rich, but it's going to help you pay the bills some. If you don't stay at one of the approved hotels, we can't give you reimbursement. 
Okay? So we have deals with those hotels. They'll give schools special rates at our events in Charleston. So we need you to support those hotels. Okay? All right. Big change in out season coaching. I'm rolling, buddy. Uh, out of season coaching. You still have three weeks, but it's no longer weeks 50, 51, or 52 on the National Federation calendar. All right? Your County Board of Education can choose the three weeks. Beginning at week 49. Week 49 begins the Sunday after the state baseball tournament ends. All right? Now, they still got to be consecutive weeks. But let me explain consecutive. The week of July 4th is dead. Tell your kids, tell your parents, let them know now. Okay, the week of the 4th, we can't do anything. Be a great time to take vacation. Okay? So, you can do two weeks, take off the week of the 4th, come back and get you one week. That's three consecutive. You can do one week before the 4th, take the 4th off, come back two consecutive weeks to get you three consecutive. All right? You can do three weeks before the 4th now, or you can wait and do three weeks after if you want to use the whole month of July after that. But it's got to be set by your county board of education, and every school in the county has the same three weeks. But two counties side by side may not have the same three weeks. Everybody okay? Any questions on that? All right. Also, they must be volunteered for athletes. If Susie comes up and Susie says she wants to be a part of the all-season track workouts during the three weeks, don't tell her no because she didn't run track last year. Don't tell her no because she's slow. You know what a major will put her in. Give her a go. All right? She'll figure out if she doesn't belong or she'll figure out what she can do. Don't tell her no. She goes to your school, let her participate. Okay? Flex days. It took a long time. About five years of fighting for more days. and finally got six flex days. Okay? They've got to have principal approval. Now understand this. The three-week period is for every sport all right, in your county. Flex days are for your individual team. All right? Principal approval, AD approval. When you get a flex day, make sure they're documenting it and they're filing it. So if we catch you out running try, and that competitive school that your rival over there sees you out practicing on an odd day where you should be, and they call the office, we just call your principal and say, your track team was out practicing. Was that a flex day for them? They can look at their phone and say, sure was. Good to go. So document it. Make sure your AD or principal document your flex days. All right? It cannot be used the first week of the season. Most football coaches want your kids to run track. But football coaches, sometimes they have different thoughts, you know? So maybe they just want you to win. They just want control, you know? So they say, don't you run track? So this first week of track season, they decide to have three flex days for football. That's why that rule's in there. If we want kids to play in every sport, you cannot do that. Your flex days cannot be during the first week of another season. Okay? Any part of the day counts as a full day for your flex day. They cannot be used on Sunday. Now, remember, during the three-week period, Sundays were good. That's three weeks. That's the only time of the year where we approve Sundays. Flex days, we don't want Sundays. If you want a Sunday for a flex day, you have to call Mr. Dolan and ask for permission. He has to bring it before our board of directors. So number one, you better ask a month or two ahead, better ask two months ahead of time. Because they don't meet every they don't meet every month during the summer. Okay? Number two, here's the deal. If you're just working out your kids on a Sunday afternoon, we're not going to approve that. But if you're going to a camp that legitimately runs Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it would get a more considerate look. Do you understand? We're trying to keep Sundays out of it, but in some situations, and it's something really important your kids go to, it could get approved. All right, okay. um, flex days do not be used as part of a tryout. They must be voluntary. I touched on that already. It's not your tryouts. They've got to be voluntary. Anybody wants to come, and they do not count as practice days. Don't go punishing kids saying you didn't come to any of our flex days or three week period when they come out with the team. Don't don't do things like that. It's voluntary and it can't be required. All right, don't mess it up. All right. <clears throat> NFHSLearn.com is a great website. It has great educational tools. It's a little hard to navigate. Just go to the SSAC website, and there's a link top right-hand corner. All coaches, heads and assistant coaches, one time have to take the heat illness prevention. Sudden cardiac arrest, all coaches one time. Take it, print the certificate, give it to your ADA principal, make sure they file it. Now, all coaches every year annually have to take the concussion in sports, and that's not going to change. I mean, that's, I mean, all you got to do is read a newspaper, pick up a magazine, watch TV, and know concussions are not going away, and the evaluation of concussions in sports is a big deal, so you've got to take that every year. Create a safe and respectful environment, it's voluntary, but strongly recommended. The rest of these courses are very good, however, that's up to you, these are free. 
Okay? Again, required one time, required one time, required every year. There are also courses that the NFHS provides that are really good, sports specific. There is a fee to watch those. But if you, if you want a really good course on fundamentals and uh, practice suggestions and teaching suggestions, those are good courses. You cannot start a practice without a physical. It has to be after June 1, 2016, which we are. <coughs> In May, when you start giving stuff out, say your county requires the physical for the three week period. Our office does it, but your county may. If your county requires a physical for the three week period, make sure it's after June 1st, 2017, not in May. No physicals in May. No physicals in May are good for next school year, June 1, okay? Now, when you give out physical forms, if you haven't passed them out in your preseason meetings yet, please use the new one that says May 2016. If you've got one that doesn't say that, recycle those and print the new one. May 2016 has statements down here about sudden cardiac arrest and concussions that you provided the parents educational materials. You have that legal obligation to do that. This is signing and it's kind of accepting that they receive those from you. All right? Um, student signature, parent signature. On the back side, make sure you get the parent signature once again and then the doctor's signature. Don't turn those in your coach or AD to get a sign there, but he's got to give them back to you. Okay? Now, when you print this, it's going to automatically put the CDC concussion education sheet. That is the sheet that you have, that on that physical was signed that the parents received. We also did this in Summers County, and I would advise this. I, I was simple minded, so what I did is I gave everybody two of these. One they could keep and actually have as an educational information, things you need, and one they had to sign, date, and get back to me and throw it in the file. That way I had myself covered and I proved I had provided them that form. Okay? Pardon me? Sorry about that. That's a concussion form. You need to give it to the parents. You need to document it. Sudden cardiac arrest form. You need to give it to the parents. You need to document it. Everybody good? Now, another form that prints automatically is the opioid form. There's no requirement on this. We just strongly believe it in the office. I believe it personally. My wife is a nurse. My son dislocated his elbow his junior year. That's a painful injury. He comes home with a prescription for oxycodone. Okay? You've been to Southern West Virginia where I live? Whew, rampant. It's bad. It's good people too. Let's be very careful because it masks the pain. It doesn't heal you, but it sure makes you feel okay. You have to be very careful. Even when you've got the prescription. So my wife takes the bottle, she takes one pill out. She says, Matt, one pill or not, that's it. You're not taking these. After this, we had to go and deal with it. Plus, she's seen it. You know? We've got people in our hometown who've watched it. I don't care if the doctor prescribes or not. Be careful and educate your kids. Okay? All right. <clears throat> Sudden cardiac arrest. Every three days, we lose an athlete. All right? This also happens a lot to our officials and coaches. We need to be prepared. My wife provided me this. She's pretty handy. Okay? Look at that. If, you, if somebody has a heart attack or a heart issue, if you get them help in less than two minutes, hey, they're in pretty good shape. Four minutes, ah, okay. Now go to eight minutes, not looking good. Let it go to ten minutes, almost none. So if you don't have CPR and you don't get started right away with those compressions, if you have your AD locked up down in the main office and you're up here at the track facility and you've got to go all the way down there and go through locked doors and get it bring it up, then it's too late. So have a plan. Here's how you have a plan. Number one, have the AED available. Know where it's at. Have somebody that knows they're the one going to get it if anything ever happens. They're going fast. Number two, make sure you've got a large group like your whole track team. Somebody's got CPR certification. All right? Or get the simplified class that got off right now by somebody who start to compression. Number three, who's going to call 911? Don't have panic. Make sure somebody knows they're the ones going to do that. Okay? Number four, use the AED and don't be afraid of it. Now, it's better if you have someone trained, just because the more you've done something, the better you are at it. But don't be afraid of the AED. It talks to you like you're in the first grade. It really, literally, it does. It tells you every step of the way what to do. All right? It puts, when you put those pads on, it's not going to do anything until it reads it should. That's not on you. It's on the machine. It'll read whether it's going to shock or not. And if it's going to, it will tell you, step away, step away. Okay, I mean, it's, it's a good machine. Trust it and have it because you saw, you see that. 
Now, do you want to be the person that just stands there and waits on the ambulance? How quick is your ambulance going to get there? Have a plan, okay? Emergency action plan. He knows to be prevented, guys. Hey, some athletes come in ready to go. And they preseason train and they can't wait. Some guys jump off the couch and here they are. All right, we have to be careful. They need to know your athletes. Make sure your practice schedule accommodates that. Don't go too soon, too hard, or too long at the beginning. All right, have practice schedules that work it appropriately. Make sure your water breaks are on a practice schedule. Try a unique sport. We're going to get the heat index. Well, who knows what the heat is in track? I mean, one day it's 30 degrees, then it's 50, and the next day it's 90. And then all of a sudden it's going to be 80 or 90 every day when it hasn't been. All right, so you have to, you have to be acclimatized to the heat just like other sports. So be aware of it and make sure you give your kids plenty of water because those things are avoidable. All right, on our index card, it doesn't apply too much to track, but it certainly can later in the year. On a bad heat index day, you just modify your schedule. You modify what you're doing. More water and football like you take your pads off. Gold, you do even more. And orange, you have to shut down until the conditions change. Guys, all this that I've went over as far as concussions and things that are your responsibility as a coach is state law. You must take because it's simply 336 in concussion class or you're not supposed to coach. The principal is supposed to monitor that and keep it on file. Okay? The link is available at the SSAC website to the NFHS Learn. Any questions on that? All right? Now, this one is a follow-up of things I've already covered. Use the right physical form. Make sure the parents have signed it. Make sure they got the CDC and the sudden cardiac arrest letter. You take the course injury report. If you have a kid get a concussion, there's an injury report in the coach's packet to fill it out. Mail it to the guy's name and address on the bottom of the form, Dr. Dan Martin at Richard E. Weston. He tracks all of our concussions statewide. Does a tremendous job for us. Okay? Return to play protocols really changed and be ready to go over it. So bear with me. If you're a coach, I'm sorry, but you know I am a coach. Did it for 30 years and loved every moment of it. All right, that young lady there had a rough of a time with the uh, herbs. And Athens, even do the good ones sometimes, okay? She wiped that head on the way down. Now, when she gets up, she may not be able to walk in a straight line, okay? Now, when you see that, guess what she is for the day? Done. Done. Okay? I can tell you horror stories about some football coaches this year who had kids come off the field and report. My ears are ringing. My head hurts. And they put them back in the game. Don't be that guy. Okay? Now, no more than one progression or step per day. Get ready to go over. If you have any doubt, if they show symptoms or signs of concussion, unless you have one of these six medical professionals there, you have to assume they're done for the day. Okay? Remember, Coach, you're hired by your Board of Education to protect that athlete. And remember those 10 good faith reasons that you'd have to back in court? That would be one of them, my friend. That you took the concussion course and therefore you knew if no health professional was there to say they're okay, they weren't okay. If they had signs or symptoms of a concussion. Now, here's the six people that can diagnose a concussion. An MD, a DO, a DC, a nurse practitioner, a PA, or a registered athletic trainer. Not an authorized certified athletic trainer, but the real certified athletic trainer. Those six people can diagnose a concussion. You have one of them hired, that's great. You're blessed. One of them is at the track meet, not hired by you. They come down out of bleachers. Mr. Jones, Dr. Jones comes out of bleachers and he'll take a look at your kid. That's great. But if he says that kid's good to go back in, have him write it down for you. This is not hired by your board, and you are. Okay? All right, now, if a kid has a concussion, wants school officials, anybody that works in the school system, that's you, coach. You were hired. Okay? Once you notice know a concussion, you've got to go to the protocol. Each progression has to take 24 hours. You cannot rush it anymore. It's a minimum of six days. If you've ever had a concussion, you know it's probably more than that. But a minimum of six, 24 hours per progression. So, I have a concussion diagnosed, then I have 24 hours of no activity, complete physical rest. School officials need to be notified. Uh, teachers need to know it too. It impacts the academic day, what they should be challenged, what they should be asked to do. All right, second, 24 hours, light aerobic exercise. Everything's good. No signs of concussion. We move to day three. Sports-specific exercise. Okay, I ran the hurdles today. But coach, as soon as I finish running those hurdles for the last five minutes, now when I'm done, my head's throbbing. Coach, I do not feel good. My head is hurting. All right, shut them down. The next day, they can come
come back to this exact spot. They, can't, they don't know have to go back to the beginning, but they cannot advance into progressions. So they would come back to right here in a 24-hour period. Everybody understand? Now, coaches, here's a bad thing. I have great respect for coaches. And I hate to put a bird on them. You don't have a train. They're every day. You don't have a team dog. They're every day. Your kids can go to the So, use the coach that can take the progressions. They've been diagnosed. You take them through these progressions. All right, you log it in a notebook. Keep your records. Be in contact with the doctor's office. Make sure you get through all these and send them back to the doctor with the results of the progressions and the doctor can release them to play. Okay? Does it have to be the same doctor that diagnoses the concussion and releases them? No, it doesn't. However, guys, once you're diagnosed with a concussion, it's going to finish up another one. are out six days Joey comes to school the next day, and Joey thinks he's playing football. All right? School knows he has a concussion. Knows he was diagnosed because the mother called the school and informed him, remember? Well, when the mother found out now that he couldn't play football, the mother called me. She was crazy. Okay? <laughs> because she was playing football, because Joey's her son, and she'll decide, and all this kind of, you know, I'm like, no, man. He has a concussion. The school knows that. He has a minimum of six days. He has to go to this protocol. And do these progressions. We'll see about that. Bam. Okay? Click. Yes, it is. Calls back in three hours. Took my son to a doctor, and the other doctor says he doesn't have a concussion. I said, ma'am, he was diagnosed with a concussion by a medical professional. I said, he will set six days, and he has to go through the progressions. All right? So once the school knows it, guys, it's six days minimum. You can't just jump doctors to get somebody clear. Everybody understand? Okay. It's in the best interest of the kid. We have to err on the side of safety. All right. So, went in doubt, set them out. Police sanction your events. Richard Messenger knows everything there is about trial. If he doesn't, he can get on the phone with somebody who can answer you in a heartbeat all over this country. All right. Great respect for him and what he can do. If you have a question about technical issues, <laughs> you, you should contact him. If you have questions about any of the things I've covered, eligibility, stuff like that, I'm your guy. But if it's track specific, he's in charge. Thank you, sir. You know, every year we make some track rule changes. There's a few minor changes this year. If you're one of those guys who like to have access to your rule book 24 7, you can download the ebook from the National Federation website, $5.99 for the rule book, $5.99 for the case book. If you have an athlete at your school that has a special needs, I guess Dr. Mathis at the clinic has already brought up one example. Okay? If you have an athlete who has a special need, you need to talk with your principal. You all need to look at this IEP, this Model 4 plan, see what kind of accommodations that athlete might need. Then you need to write a letter to the Activities Commission explaining the special needs of that student. You might attach a documentation for it. You send it to the office, they will review it, they will respond with a letter telling you what kind of accommodations that young man or young lady could have. You need to take a copy of that letter with you to each and every meeting to the meeting directors. If you have one that has a really unique situation, you need to notify meet management in advance. For example, if you have a blind athlete who needs a guide runner, that means we're only going to be able to run seven athletes in the race that that, that athlete is in. So meeting directors need to know that in advance. The rule changes, games committee responsibility, not a big change, but we say now that the games committee can provide fluids during races. This particularly happens in cross country. It could happen in our state meet if it were 90 degrees on Friday night when we were running 3200. Games committee now can say, yes, we will provide water for the athletes. They will decide how that water is going to be dispensed. Individual coaches cannot provide liquids during the competition. It's more apt to happen during the cross country meeting. This year, for every race of two laps or more, there will be a bell to signal the last lap or some kind of a device. The preferred method is a bell. That's to make sure that officials are alert that the finish is coming up, that the large spectators, the finish is coming near. 
The Bell's preferred method, we certainly don't want starters standing out there shooting their pistol for every gun lap, for every final lap. That would take a lot of money for them because expensive shells are about a dollar apiece. In the rule book, this is not a major change, but for years, starters have disqualified out into a false start. Well, the rule book didn't permit that. It said only the referee could disqualify athletes during a meet. So now the rules committee has added, except as provided by Rule 361, which addresses the start. Also, it's the starter's responsibility to make sure that we're receiving that last lap so they can designate someone to do that for us. Field judge mechanics, we went to the flags last year during the regular season. <laughs> If there is a meet that you're at and they don't have flags, yes, you can still use fair or foul. Fair being replacing the white flag, foul replacing the red flag. We still prefer to have the flags. Not any uniform changes except you now can wear a flag on both the top and the bottom of the uniform, provided they are less than two by threes. Receiving assistance. Probably pertains more to cross country in Rule 87, but it also can happen during the running race. If there's medical personnel at the meet, athletes are not allowed to assist them. Though. If they do, both the athlete who does the assisting and the one who was assisted are disqualified. If there are no medical personnel there, and Wayne falls and I stop and help him up and get him to the finish line, I'm not going to be disqualified because there was no medical assistance, but he is going to be disqualified because he received assistance. And again, just another example of the same slide. Receiving physical aid during a race or trial from any other person. So again, anyone who receives that assistance during the race is going to be disqualified. Track construction, all we simply mean there is most tracks do not have curves. Probably the only meet you go to all year will be the state meet where we use a curve. All the other meets, there's no curve. We're now saying cones should be placed around the whole curve, five feet apart, all the way around the curve on both ends. The reason for doing that is to make sure athletes stay on the track during the course of the race. Forming heats, this is not a major change, but we deleted uh, what was in 564 that we said that if two or more athletes from the same school were in a given heat, then you move one of the athletes into another heat. Well, since we started using high tech, and there's another program out there called Meat Pro, they do not do that, and meat management hasn't done that for several years. So we simply took that rule out of the book. To start, we haven't changed anything except to say, in the 800 and up outdoors, and all competitors are steady and motionless without their hands touching the ground. So when the starter calls the athletes on your mark, so as they step up to the line, no one can go down into a three-point stance. That's why the rule was added last year in the places out west. When the referee called on their marks, as they step to the line, they put their hands on the ground. The rule says, out, hands touching the ground. If you've looked at the rule book at all, rule six and seven, I mean, Mind. One was the throwing rule, one was the jumping rule, and now says field events. The reason for doing that was definitions were in one section in rule six and rule seven, they were identical, except one said jumps and one said throws. What was happening was a rule might be passed in the jump section that was really meant to apply also to the throw section. No one caught it, so one rule was passed this year, you had to wait another year to catch the other rule change. So we put them together, try to simplify the rule. You can read how the sections are, are divvied up. It's not a big deal. Each section of the rule book has its own individual section now. The biggest thing we've done is there's a little black tab. It says SP for the shot put, DS for the discs, BB for the pole block, pageant. So as you thumb through your rule book, you get to rule six, you can find exactly where you need to go for the rule by simply looking at the letters. The thing we did add into field events is, number one, there could be no warm-ups except when it is supervised 
either by the coach or by an official, and the venue has been declared open by the meeting director. The other thing we've added is, once competition has begun in an event, there can be no warm-ups using the runways, the aprons, the rings, or any of the implements, unless it has been something that's already scheduled. For example, in the high jump and the pole ball, after a certain number of jumps, athletes are allowed to have a warm-up. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. An example of this happening was last year at the Wisconsin State meeting, where my wife happens to be the chief of the pole ball. I'm the flight coordinator. I have a young lady going down the runway with her pole. As she leaves the ground, here comes a young lady running down the runway behind her. I immediately offered on her to go get that girl. To find out, come to find out, she was a triple jumper from two runways over. Last year, that was permitted by rule. But this year, that runway is off limits because competition has begun. For officials, rule six, 210 says to be able to brace. That primarily is a javelin breaks during the throw. I've never seen a discus break, I suppose it could. But if it breaks once in the air, then we do not count that throw and we give the athlete a replacement throw. If it breaks once it hits the ground, then we're going to measure that throw and it counts as one of his or her throws. In the shot put, Officials, again, this is something for you. Simply saying, if there's a foul, if the athlete touches the top of the end of the stop board before leaving the serve. And the reason we've added that as a point of emphasis, really, is for those athletes that are using the spin technique or something, and they don't like their throw, and they want the foul, they reach up and tap the top of the toe. So officials, we have to be alert to that foul. Again, the rules have been readjusted, all the rules number rule 8 is now rule 7 talks about special events we don't have any special events in West Virginia other than shallow hurdles and our rules are very specific about that but if this was, if you're taking the test and it asks you if there are special events that are covered with high school rules what do you use you refer to USA and track and field youth rules and a prime example of that would be the weight throw cross country course we haven't changed anything except for saying if you have a permanent cross country course, now instead of using just flags, you can put up permanent directional markers, and those are perfectly legal. Again, officials test question. The wind gauge, where this is primarily affects, is in the triple jump, because you have multiple boards in the triple jump. And when you have multiple boards, you're going to place the wind gauge 20 meters from board others from the pit. Again, that's probably something that you'll see on test questions. The biggest thing in 461, we simply now say e-cigarettes are tobacco products. That's in all the Federation rule books, and we made sure there was that in the track and field rule. Again, this, in the high jump, the same thing applies in the pull ball. A competitor who has passed three consecutive heights and has not entered the competition shall be permitted one warm up without the crossbar or the bungee in place, provided they are coming in at that height. And the reason that was added last year, a couple places, athletes, especially in the pole ball, would take, they have three passes, they do a warm up. Oh, I'm not coming in. And now they do three more passes and they get another warm up when they came into the competition. You only get one warm up once the competition has begun. In the rule book now, there's no mention of yards in any of the measurements for the length of track distances. While we're on that subject, there are three states this year who are, which are using strict metric measurements for throws and jumps. And it's a major movement toward doing that across the country, and part of the reason is they're saying, number one, athletes who compete in summer track for USA track and field or AAU already know about metric measurements, so they have some to, re to relate to. <coughs> the other people who are complaining about apparel measurements are timing, timers, those folks who do high tech, because they hate to sit there and type in the, the one quarter, the half, the three quarters, partly because we have a 
officials who could not write legibly. And it's hard to decide. Is that a quarter? Is that three quarters? Mike's laughing. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. But that's something that will probably be on the questionnaire we come out, that comes out in spring. And we'll talk about that in just a couple minutes. Again, the pole vault's the same as the high jump. In the cross country section, <coughs> we have places we had miles listed. So what we've done is simply taken the rule and listed all of the things for disqualifications into one area. Points of emphasis, the rubber discus is a point of contention across the country. High school track and field was the only place you were allowed to use the rubber discus. NCAA, USA, track and field, IWA, all require you to have a metal rim disc. Actually, there was a proposal last year to eliminate the rubber discus. I fought against the rubber discus as an official. I hate rubber discus, okay? But as a former school administrator, as a person knowing about some of the track programs in our state, I also realized our schools can buy rubber discs for $15, $20, where a metal rim disc costs somewhere between $75 to $80. So consequently, you can buy three or four rubber discs for the price of a metal rim. That again will be on the questionnaire at the end of the season. Just a reminder, if you have rubber discs being used, officials working with you will need to make sure you check those because if they hit the cage, they can develop gouges in them, which can become finger holes. If you as the official see that during the competition, you need to pound that implement for the remainder of that day if not by the deputy using it. Track and field uniforms, again, this is just simply a reminder, coaches. At the meet, clerks check the uniform. We also know that as coaches, you have the responsibility for making sure the athletes are in an illegal uniform. You provide them a legal uniform. Let's just say, for example, you provide them a pair of black solid color shorts. Well, the athlete decides they don't like the fit of that short, so they go down to Dick's Sporting Goods or one of the other local sporting goods store, and they buy themselves a pair of those nice black tights to wear in the face of your uniform. All well and good, as long as it is a solid color. The problem comes in, they buy Under Armour, they buy Nike Pro, those logos go all the way around the waistband. They are illegal because they have more than one logo on them. So coaches, you need to remind your athletes if they're going to buy something to wear in place of their uniform bottom, it needs to match your school issue uniform. And it must be <coughs> Again, nothing was done with the undergarments. Remember, anything above the knee is legal, color, design. We don't pay any attention to it. There can be four athletes in a relay, and they all can have different designs, as long as they're above the knee, okay, as far as undergarments. If they're wearing something below the knee, it has to be a solid color, and they have to be the same color if they're on the relay. One logo or two, that's one logo because it fits in, in two of the quarter square pants. Adidas has one the same way. As long as it all fits in that two and a quarter square inch, we're okay. Officials, the set up, association, officials, association, central hub, which you're going to have a part of because we're 100% state and we're with MacArthur, you have a searchable rule book. If you have a particular word, like an interference, for example, and you want to look up all the rules, you simply go to that hub, type in interference, and it tells you every place in the rule book that that comes up. From the Learning Center, if you don't know anything about pole vault, you have a pole vaulter who wants to learn, this is a great tool, uh, and it's free, so free to, feel free to use that. From our coaches committee, at the regional meetings, we're going to do entries the same as we've always done. Uh, team manager Light is a super program for us, it's done a great job. Reminder coaches, we have to have a pole vault verification form at each and every meet, including the regional and the state meet. Make sure you bring those. The most important thing on that slide is monitor the weight throughout the season because athletes weight do change. If we enter a meet outside the state of West Virginia, we can only compete a few events that we do in West Virginia. Same thing in the running events. You can only compete in running events up to 
ones we run in our state. <coughs> yes, you can do the DMR because the 1200 is less than the 1600. State meet qualifiers, we haven't changed. In the high jump and the low law, we're bringing the top four from each regional plus anyone who makes the automatic qualifying standard. If there's a tie for fourth place and does not meet the qualifying standard, then we must do a jump off using our first place tiebreaker. For the running events and the other field events, we're bringing the top three plus the next four best times or distances in each of the state meet. Those are from the regional. 800, 1600, 3200, 4800. We're still going to use the uh, lane assignments, the alley assignments that we have in the last eight or ten years, and we actually have to convince some other states to go to the same process. Shuttle harder relay, you get one marker per athlete, and it has to be on the line between the two lanes. State meet implements, by Wednesday we're going to have a list up on the state meet web or the state website listing the meet implements that we'll be using during the state meet. So the coaches wait until after Wednesday to buy your implements. If you have to receive a copy of the Federation questionnaire that I talked about earlier, and those officials across the state, I send it to all of them. Mr. Ryan will send it to his coaches. Please fill that out. It takes five or ten minutes to ask you about the current question. The reason that's so valuable is they provide, when we go to the rules committee, they provide us a list, percentage of the coaches, percentage of officials, percentage of state offices in favor or against each rule proposal. So it's something that we use a lot of. If you need to get a hold of me during the season, that's my cell phone. Yes, I do text, and that's my email. If you text me or call me and I don't answer, that means I'm probably on a track someplace trying to help someone else make a decision. Any questions? Make sure, yes. He had a problem with the kid showed up an individual and he got the school doesn't have a cross country team. Is he allowed to run in their team? No, sir. I'll answer that. That's what's right. I'm not going to see one eligibility for that school. Yes. That school can only have one person, but they have had that person on eligibility to build a team with just one member. And so it has to have a school personnel correct. Can't do anything. Yes. yes. He cannot be on an attached app. Got to have a coach, got to be on his squills bill. Any other questions? Very good. 55 minutes. You're out of here. Zero. Make sure you sign your card. Make sure you have your email on there. And I'll collect this for you. Thank you. I forgot to do that.